difference. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to the Mental Toughness and Body Show. My name is Rob Evans, and I am so excited. I've got a very special guest here today. It's Dr. Paul Cribb. Hi, Paul. How are you? G'day, Rob. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Now, I wanted to be part of Paul's environment today. So my background here is the, the beautiful view of the beach I've got. And because Paul's uh, in sunny North Queensland and I'm in the cold, dirty part of Australia at the moment, <laughs> or old Victoria. Uh, now, I wanted to just uh, briefly talk about how I came to know Paul. And I don't want to steal Paul's thunders. See, I've got a couple of questions uh, around Paul's background and everything. But um, I met you, Paul, back in 2012, so eight years ago now. Yes. And what, I can't remember what drew me into you now. Obviously, I came to one of your courses and I want to, I've always had this desire to grab more knowledge about, um, about um, nutrition and just understand it more for my body, but as well and to, to pass that on to clients. And uh, after that, I think that was a three day. Was that a three day or a two day? I can't remember. Yes, we have two and three day courses, or we did used to when it was face to face. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, the old days. <laughs> uh, and from that moment on, I have lived there. Well, you're the owner of Metabolic Precision, mpbody.com. And uh, since that day, I suppose I've had the most clarity that I've ever had on I'm on the right pathway to. Um, and you said something that uh, from that day forward, I've always stuck with, and I always talk to my clients about it, and that's optimizing your health. It's not just about the body shape, but it's about optimizing your health as well. Um, so Paul is also my coach, and so we we met back in 2012, but it was only this year that, well, it's probably been the last two years that I've been looking for a strength and conditioning coach, someone to help me even more with the nutrition side of things. And well, and we might talk about this uh, in a moment, but there's so much rubbish out there. People that do these crash diets and um, drugs and all kinds of stuff. I'm like, do you know what? I need to find somebody that lives the same sort of philosophy uh, because I've been living it for like eight years. And then I thought, hmm, I'll ask Paul. And then you said to me, well, if you want the best, why don't you come <laughs> and work with us? And I said, I, I didn't think you worked one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, so I'm very... Special, I'm, ones. special ones. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very privileged for that. And I want to, at the end of this, we'll talk about um, some of my transformation. But um, I'm just so grateful for having had the opportunity to meet you and now for, you know, you to me coaching me personally. I wanted to um, ask you, what has brought you to this moment where, you know, you've created MP Body and, um, you know, a little bit about your background? Well, mate, firstly, thank you. Uh, that was a heck of an introduction, um, and I'm quite humbled. Uh, and You're I'm welcome. very, um, very privileged that I actually do get to attract uh, quality professionals like like you. And I think that's probably why I did get into the industry to be able to flesh out people like yourself in the industry. The whole idea why why we got into this was the PT industry. When I was back doing it, I think I was probably one of the first PTs on the on the Gold Coast in Queensland many moons ago. In fact, I'm, I know we were the only personal trainers and I couldn't sort of get out of that feeling of being such alone and and uh, and lost at sort of sea and there wasn't really any organizations or anything like that and I always said to myself man it'd be great if I had a structure or, or some sort of science-based process that I know that I could rely on and and a network of people that I could draw on and you know because I, I was watching physiotherapists and myopaths yeah. and all these other great professions in the industry and they had all these, you know, organizations and structures and PTs had nothing. Yeah. So that's, and that's pretty much as soon as I got into that position of, of being able to sort of sit down and put MP together. Uh, that's what I did. I did a couple of degrees and I, I put myself through a PhD in, in transformation. I was actually after some answers, really. Mm. I'd actually sold up my businesses on the Gold Coast. We ended up with about six or seven studios and, I walked away from that and just put myself through a PhD at uni and, and I really wanted to get some more answers. And, and based on that, I thought, well, if I've got all this information now, why not put it into a system that personal trainers and other professionals can follow that they know is going to create a process of transformation? 
So when you say more answers, were you feeling like, okay, you've been working? So how many years had you been in the industry up to that point? Oh, I didn't go. I did my third degree. I walked into Victoria University. You'd probably like this, Robert Footscray there. And yeah. the terrific old professor there, Mick Carey. I walked in. I said, I want to do, I want to do a PhD in uh, da, 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 you know, with this, with transformation and muscle and fat loss and everything. He goes, well, have you done chemistry? I said, no. He said, have you done biochemistry? I said, no. He said, well, go and do a chemistry degree. And I think that he, he thought that'd get rid of me, but I did. Yeah. I went around the corner and, and enrolled in um, Victoria University, Footscray campus. And I did a, I did a, uh, an honours degree in, in chemistry and then went, did a, uh, a bachelor's in biochemistry. So all up, it took me about six years. <laughs> okay. So, so you were still doing PT stuff? Yes. Up to that point? Yeah, right. Yes, I was. I was. I moved to Melbourne um, at that point there after I'd sort of sold up my businesses on the Gold Coast and I was lucky enough to have some, uh, probably a handful of really great clients that I I started work at, I used to laugh, I used to start at work at 6am and finish at 9am in the morning. Yeah. Um, and I used to remember getting back to my car at 9 o'clock in the morning thinking, what am I going to do for the rest of the day now? Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of the times I used to just get in the car and drive down to Torquay and surf for the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. And then I thought, well, this isn't going to last very long. I better do something else. And so that's when I started to go back to university and, and started on that path of, of, of doing what I was doing. And when I, I, I did my degrees part-time, obviously working uh, as well. And, and when I finally got the opportunity to do a PhD, um, I sat down again with my professors who they got to know me pretty well by then because they knew I was, you know, there for the long haul. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to design my own PhD. I said, because usually with PhD programs, you've got to actually just go wherever someone offers you a program and hope that you yeah. like doing it. So I actually sat down and I mapped out my whole PhD program and then they had to put it to their ethics committee at VU and to their credit they really pushed through and, and helped me get it through and I was actually able it was great Rob it was something that you would really relate to you got to actually study exactly what you wanted to learn and what you wanted yeah. to know yeah um, the hardest part of that is is my supervisors really didn't know where we were going either because they'd never really done this sort of thing before as well That's so they, they were great they sort of guided me and and and, and helped me along the way there as well so when um, you talked uh, before about, you know, you wanting to know the answers, were you feeling like you'd been in the industry, you were helping people achieve, um, you know, transformation? Some, I guess, look, to be honest, some would have gotten much better results than others and maybe some came in and they didn't really get the results. Were you like, I don't understand what physiologically is going on in people? You know what? It was probably more, it was probably more the psychological, Rob, and the environmental, as you know. Yeah. Um, I'd kind of like the muscle, the muscle and the, the fat physiology stuff really sort of intrigued me. And I, I did, we used to do muscle biopsies on, on part of my thesis was training people and taking muscle samples before and after the, 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 the 12 week and 24 yeah. week programs and, and assessing Let's sign up for that program. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was uh, until they got to the muscle biopsy rub. It wasn't a lot of fun for a lot of the no. guys. It was funny. It was the biggest, strongest guys were the, the ones that hated it the most. Yeah. You know, all the, uh, we did a lot of elderly studies as well. And you found the, the frail old eighties and 90 year olds. Like, just just like, cut yeah, me up. No worries. Yeah, just stick it in. No anesthetic. Yeah, no worries. Just put it in. <laughs> and we had these big, strong, you know, 20 year olds and they were throwing up and fainting and oh, gee. <laughs> but it was it was more about as you know rob you could relate to this being in the industry for as long as you have it's great to see some people get a great result but you want to know why the others aren't getting a good result yeah and i want to address that whole systematic approach about why they're not getting that other why they're not getting that result and so probably with a phd it's you kind of the studies that you see published and i've got you know i've got mine published in in sports science journals but it's about, it's the tip of the iceberg. It's kind of like the iceberg. You don't actually get to see the rest of how big the iceberg is under the water. Yeah. And that's where with the whole PhD thing you, you, that you have to actually learn, okay, if you're going to do a study with people, then you've got to get, why are they turning up? How are you going to make them turn up? What, how are you going to create an environment that's going to make them stick at this and get a result? And if mm. they're dropping off, why are they dropping off? Yes. Um, so there was all those sort of factors involved that really relate to what we do on a, on a daily basis. So that's where it was most intriguing to me to look at, okay, what needs to be in place for someone to embrace a new way of, of living or way of life and then staying at it long enough to see a result. And yeah. that was a real process that, yeah, that was probably the most intriguing part of the whole thing. So tell me your mindset as you were studying and doing your PhD, were, 
were in the back of your mind or it might've been in the front of your mind thinking, do you know what? I'm going to create MP body or whatever it was in your mind at the time to help share this. So was it, I don't know what I was thinking, Rob, to be honest. I, I, it was kind of just, I was just like everyone else at the time. I was, you know, in my twenties and I was just sort of living that week to week, month to month. And yeah, I had a business and I was, you know, making money week to week and all that sort of stuff. And mm. I kind of always thought about, I wanted, to know a bit more and do a bit more, but you never really look at the the bigger picture. I I was never really academically inclined at school. Um, yeah. And in fact, I probably went to school for the sports. Um, yeah. People used to ask my, my father, what, what does Paul study at high school? And he'd say, he majors in football and romance. Yeah. And he's failing both. <laughs> so that, was, that was a snapshot of what my high school years were like. Um, and I managed to get myself into into university some on a on a scholarship, believe it or not, on a football scholarship. Otherwise, I don't think I've ever would have got in. And from there, I suppose all all that really happened was that I kept finding things that interest me while yeah. I was cutting along the way. But uh, with your podcast, what this is about, I, I, I was thinking about this, and one of the things that probably resonated with me was I never forget I enrolled in my my chemistry degree when I was 27 and like chemistry is something that's just like another language to me. I just had no idea. And I remember, and I had my own business and I actually walked into the university and I paid for my first three years up wow. front because I thought I'm going to do this because otherwise I know I'll, I'll drop out. Yeah. So I paid for the first three years. And I remember the ladies, it was the old fashioned signing up at the table and all that sort of stuff and yeah. writing the checks and we used to do all that stuff. And they were like, you know, I had, I was a check for 27 grand or something like that. I gave them and they're like, Oh, we've never seen this before. I thought I've got to do this, otherwise I'm not going to I'm not going to see it through. Yeah. And the next day was my first lecture, and my first lecture was in um, was in basic chemistry, and I remember looking up, walking into the lecture theatre before anyone else it was a lab actually, and they had the big periodic table you know up on the wall, huge yeah. one. I'm looking at it for about ten minutes. I'm trying to you know you look at something, you're trying to find the puzzle and and, and yeah. work it out and see it if it makes sense. sense. Yeah, and I'm sitting there looking at it, going, I can't make sense of this. I've got, this this means nothing to me. Yeah. And then I'm thinking. I've just dropped 27 grand on this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. You know, and, and, and it all just sort of come crashing down thinking, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to do this? Because I am way out of my depth here. Like I said, yeah. in high school, I couldn't concentrate on anything really unless it had a football with it yeah. uh, or a skirt maybe, which probably isn't <laughs> the nicest thing to say. But, hey, when you're in high school, that's what life's like and it doesn't prepare you very well for later on. So, yeah, and I suppose when you're talking about the your podcast, Rob, the thing that I probably learned from that whole experience of putting myself into that is, is if you can learn how to learn, yes. then you can do anything. Then you can survive anywhere and you can flourish in anywhere. That's a great point because I probably the, the greatest um, boss that I ever worked for, um, Rod Chapman was his name, and he, what, he was a little bit controversial, like beautiful, lovely man. Um, but he was a bit controversial amongst his, his colleagues because he'd be like interviewing people for a job and he would say that he would take any person that has done a degree. He didn't care what the degree was because he says, if you've done a degree, that takes three, four, maybe five years time. That requires focus and dedication to be able to get through that. So he was looking deeper than the qualification. He was looking for, so what's gone into that mm. to give them you know, that piece of paper. It's yeah. not the piece of paper. It's like what's gone in into doing that. Yeah. Um, so that, that's really powerful. I can really relate to, uh, you know, what you're saying because um, I don't know whether you know this, but I used to be a chartered accountant. So I, and I was not a good student. Like uh, I remember going into my HSC year and I had no idea how I was going to pass English because it was my <laughs> worst subject and I didn't get it. You know, I didn't enjoy reading. But what I was good at was working out where's the formula to get the best outcome. And thankfully, I had a really good English teacher and English actually ended up being my best result, which yeah. is the irony of it. But it wasn't until I went to uni and I started doing things that I enjoyed because I was into... And you, you tend to do the things that you are good at. You know, I was only good at maths and I liked the, the business side of things, hence going down the accounting path. But at the same time, I was also... Uh, you know, started working out on my, my body and stuff. And then when I was 40, discovered what I really wanted to do. But you don't have to be a genius to 
a, you know, to start a career in something and, and look at where, where you are now. Um, so to, yeah, so, I mean, well done. I mean, it's just a, a beautiful transformation, isn't it? Yeah, life, life's like that, isn't it? I think it's just a constant evolution. That's, that's the exciting thing about life. I think it's always going somewhere that you haven't been before. And if you wanted to. Because yeah, a lot of people yeah. don't. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about that coming up. But, um, you know, you can easily do nothing. Mm. But if you've got that hunger to keep doing things, then that's, I think, the, the beautiful thing about life. And you just keep growing. I still feel like I'm at the beginning. I don't know how you feel about your life, but I feel like I'm just at the beginning. Yeah, look, it's a good way to be, isn't it? I think technology's probably forced us to be like that a lot now, especially in the climate that we're in. I know that through this whole pandemic, we've had to learn a whole new skills. You know, yeah. I've had to sit down and, you know, I was always okay on a computer and, you know, running a website and everything, but I've actually had to teach myself how to film, how to edit, you know, how to put yeah. videos together. And, you know, that's that was something I really steered away from doing. But it, you have to actually force yourself to keep learning yeah. new skills. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I did want to ask you briefly, um, and so tell us about your professional career because you, you went into, um, uh, well, you said football, but not AFL football. That was like rugby type footy. Yeah, rugby it? league, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, So tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, look, I was, all through high school, I was going to be a professional football player, wasn't I? You know, I didn't need to study a lot of this stuff because I was going to get graded and play for a great team like the Roosters or Balmain or something like that in Sydney and get a contract and all that. And yeah, it didn't really happen <laughs> because I wasn't quite good enough. I did. Do, I had a, a brief stint with the Gold Coast Seagulls when they were on the, on the Gold Coast there, but they defunct and it only sort of lasted a few years. I think by the time actually I was about 24, I had that many injuries. I was just, I was really beaten up from the, the training programs that these to put us through were really tough. And uh, I, uh, I, I remember my, my back actually, by the time I was 25, 26 was that sore. I was a personal trainer and I was really struggling to get through every day. Um, right. By the time I was actually 28, I could barely stand up and I was trying to work out what the hell was wrong. And I was going to physios and chiropractors. And I finally um, it got to a point where I actually had to stop working because I just had to lay down all the time and my, my back was so sore and so bad. And I slowly, I had this great business and it slowly just, you know, dissolved by the time I was 30 to nothing. And I was on, I was on the dole. Um, and I finally found, a, after about 18 months, I found a surgeon that come out from the UK and he agreed to, they did a discogram, uh, which is injecting dye into the back of your lower discs there. And they were, what they showed, they were completely ruptured. So I'd been walking around for the last uh -huh. two years with two completely ruptured discs. And I said, well, what do we do? And he said, we said, well, we take them out. And he said, I've only done one, I've only done a one level spinal fusion. He said, but with you, I've got to do two. And I've never done a two. And I said, oh, okay. What do you reckon? He said, yeah. I said, will you give it a go? And he said, yeah. He said, I'll, 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 I'll give it a go if you want to do it. And so I did it. So I had my two discs removed from my lower back at, at um, I think, 30 years of age, 29 years of age. And I had four titanium cages bolted into my lower back. Uh, and I had to do all the rehab and learn to walk and do all the, that sort of stuff again. And I remember when I got out of the hospital and went and saw him and everything, I sat down, or I didn't sit down, I was laying on the table and he, and he filled out a form and he gave me a form and he said, well, here. I said, what's this? He said, he said, well, take this to the, to the doll office. And he said, you can, you can get an invalid pension now. He said, you won't have to work anymore. And I sort of looked and I thought, wow. It's like a death sentence. I don't want to do that. I don't, you know, I don't want to spend my life doing that. Mm. So that was, that was probably a, a turning point for me. And to be honest, I didn't make a big deal about it. I just sort of left it in the drawer and I don't think I ever saw it again because it was something that I didn't really want to do. I ended up, yeah. I wanted to go back to university and, and do what I was doing. Yeah. So, yeah, there's all those sort of little life, life lessons there. And I, when I was at university doing my own, with this PhD thing, Rob leading into my professional job i i saw the amount of money that you'd need for a phd mm. um, and usually what the guys do is they get a scholarship now i i didn't want to do a scholarship because what a scholarship meant it meant doing a lot of other things that you, you didn't want to do like you had to do a lot of lecturing and a lot of other stuff that meant part of the scholarship yeah so i actually wrote down exactly the phd i wanted to do and i sent it off to a number of different companies all around the world and i sent one off to uh, ast sports science in colorado um, just on the whim that they might read it. And the guy actually read it. The, the CEO of AST Sports Science, which was a big company at the time, mm. um, he read it. And I'll never forget this, Rob, you're like this. I was sitting in my car in between clients having a snooze as a PT and I had my, my big brick phone 
yeah, yeah. I did back then. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember getting this call and it was uh, the, the thick American accent. It's like, hello. I said, hello. And I said, hello, this is Paul D'Elia from EST Sports Science. Is that Paul Cribb? And I'm like, I thought it was one of my mates. And yeah. I thought they were Jim. Yeah. <laughs> I told him to F off and hung up. <laughs> And it was actually the, the, the president of the company ringing me up to talk about this proposal. And long story short, they hired me sight unseen. I was in Melbourne and said, well, look, where do you want to do all this research? And I said, well, I've got everything set up here at Victoria University. And they said, great. So they ended up making me um, director, uh, director of research for AST. And I actually was a dream job for the next 10 years where I got to fly around yeah. the world, do research, present research, oversee research, publish research. And it, it ended up being a, a, a dream job in a lot of ways. Yeah, nice. Nice move. Yeah. So, again, it was just one of those things that you put yourself out there and, you know, the gods, I suppose. Uh, if Paul never picked up that, um, that proposal and we become great friends over the years after that, and I used to, he used to fly me everywhere to, you know, to go to these conferences and I'd come and see him in Colorado at the offices they had. And that was, you know, that was my boss. I, he pretty, pretty much left me free reign for yeah. 10 years, whatever I wanted to study, whatever I wanted to do. Uh, and he was great that way, and I, you know, I, I owe him a massive debt. And, and that's where I got to learn, Rob, all the things now that, that we do together. Um, Paul was actually, uh, he was sponsoring a number of the world's best drug-free bodybuilders. In, in the States at the okay. time, there was a very big drug-free bodybuilding movement, uh, and there still is. Um, and he had probably 10 in his stable that were these phenomenal athletes. They were great but they were looking for a nutrition coach that would really give them an edge. And then so, sort of Paul put them onto me and I got to do with them all the things that I had in my head that I thought would work, that I thought would be effective, you know, that all the research is showing that this would work. Yeah. You know, supplement timing, nutrient timing, carbs yeah. close to the workout, consistent protein, you know, all these sort of little things that we had. And, and all of a sudden I had these human guinea pigs now that if I said to them that they had to chew a bucket of concrete every day, they'd do it. Yeah. So they were great people to work with because they bodybuilders are great. They're like robots. If you tell them what to do, they will follow they exactly what yeah. to do. And so we got to fine tune a lot of the principles that, that you and I work with now. Uh, so that I got to see how they would work in a real life scenario. And more importantly, if the mistakes were there as well, you got to see what went wrong. Yes. So yeah, there was all those sort of little things along the way that have sort of led to you know, the creation of, of what we what we have with MP is, one, it's got the very strong science background, but two, it's sort of got that real applied background now. And, and you know, some people like yourself now, Rob, what you're doing, you're actually, you're that applied science of, of, of what's yeah. going on now with MP. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it is cool. Uh, I'm interested in, I, I remember you telling a story, so this would have been back in 2012 probably, um, I may get the code wrong. It may have been the NFL where you were working with these, you know, like million dollar athletes and yeah, spending all, ballers, yeah, all, there was a ballers, yeah. all this time putting together these like meal plans and so forth for them. Um, <laughs> but they wouldn't follow them. <laughs> and so I've, um, I've had the privilege of um, just in the last couple of years, being able to work with some Olympians and like gold medalists and, you know, like the, absolute phenomenal people like their mind side, uh, my, uh, mindset is fantastic um, but also uh, like listening into a lot of that um, particularly in basketball and hearing about uh, look some of these elite athletes are surviving on energy drinks and fast food and their well youthful exuberance basically yep. um, where do you think so, and, and I've also been working at a local level with some world-class like teams and stuff to try and instill into the coaches that, do you know what? I can't teach you anything about skill or anything like that. Uh, I'm working with cheerleading teams, like national cheerleading teams as my daughters do that. And I say, do you know what? Just have a look around on a competition day and look at the crap that these people are eating. I said, I guarantee you, I will give you a 10 to 20% edge if You've just focused on your nutrition. Forget about your skill. That's about energy. So where do you think there's a, a fall down in these pro, pro ranks? Cool. It's, look, it's, uh, I think the first thing comes down to the athletes that, that get to that sort of level. They get to that level because they're, they're extraordinarily gifted. Mm. Um, and then obviously you don't just get there on talent. But they've always, it hasn't become a culture for them leading up through uh, leading up through the ranks and yeah and 
actually, and, and I'll tell you that a, a great friend and colleague, um, Sue Kleiner, Dr. Sue Kleiner is a, uh, a, new, uh, a dietitian in the States in Seattle and, and she's worked with a lot of NFL teams and she, you know, she laughs, we laugh at each other's stories because she says exactly the same thing. She works with these multi-million dollar athletes that are earning millions of dollars a year and she can't get them to make breakfast and, you know, and to, you know, how to do these things because mom's been doing this sort of stuff all the time. And it's, yeah. it's just something that's not really ingrained. And so she had to really step back and create all those little skills and, and drills that people can do in the kitchen just to learn how to cook again. And I think that's a big thing, Rob. I think there's a whole um, generation of people that have grown up now, not, being in the kitchen, not not thinking mm. that cooking and, and preparing food is a part of, of regular day life. So uh, do you think the coaches don't, uh, and I know I'm generalising here because like just talking to Olympians in the last, um, the last week and a half, uh, like a whole bunch of them, mm. some of them have had really good nutritional help. But the one thing that when I've heard them say that is it's come from the coach. So do you think there are uh, like coaches that are, like just don't see that nutrition has such an important part to play in improving the result on the scoreboard. I think because coaches in any sort of sport now, it, you've got to really specialise in what you're doing. And I think a lot of times coaches just don't have the time to specialise in nutrition that, you know, it might be an interest, but yeah, it's because they're so focused on what they're doing. It's very hard for them to be that in depth. And probably the other irony is too, Rob, as you know, it's, it's one thing knowing a lot about nutrition, but it's another thing knowing how to teach it to yeah. someone, change their life. And that's a big thing with a coach. You know, first they've got to be highly skilled at, at delivering the sport or the program they're doing, but then to try and do that with nutrition as well. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's a hard basket. And that's where I suppose they try and handball it to, uh, to another professional. And if that professional is up to being able to work with a cross spectrum of different people, and that's difficult. So where do you think that we can drive the change there? Is, does it come down to, I don't know, like um, is it the, the board of directors, for instance? I mean, that's ultimately the top of some of these, say like the, the ones in the States, like whether it's baseball, NFL or whatever. Is, mm. it the, is it the manager of the team? Is it like where, where does it flow? Does it, like all of these things, it comes from the top down, doesn't it? Yeah, look, you're right. I suppose with any organisation, you, 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 you're spot on. I tend to think it's it's more it comes back to the to the individual and the environment and and as I said again look I'll I'll throw this at you um, compared to the 1960s today we spend um, less than 20 percent of what families did in the kitchen in the 1960s yeah um, the average household now in in the US and Australia spends about well less than an hour and a half in the kitchen a week. Yeah. Preparing food. Yeah. Now, contrast that now to some of the most popular shows on television that millions of people watch across the world are cooking shows. Mm. So people on one hand will, will, will sit down and, and this has been confirmed, what the, some of the highest rating shows, as you know, with MasterChef and all this going on, people will sit for an hour, an hour and a half and watch someone cook something they know they will never cook or eat That's themselves. Right. That's right. But they won't go into the kitchen because it's just not, it hasn't been ingrained in what they're doing. And, and, and here's the other interesting contrast, Rob, too. Uh, obesity rates, um, the stats for obesity only really started in the 1980s. And ever since the 1980s, they have just completely increased. Now, we've had more and more information about the perils of obesity and how to combat it and everything, but they keep going up and up and up and up. Now, yeah. what correlates with that? The amount of decrease in time we're actually spending in the kitchen. Yeah. And that's a big thing that, that, that is concerned, you know, Shah and I with the whole fitness industry. Because as you know, with the courses, Rob, Shah sets up a makeshift kitchen and she actually shows how to yeah. make like an omelette in three minutes and chicken yeah. cacciatore in nine minutes. Yeah, and that it's, sort of stuff. it's really and, powerful. Yeah, it blows people's mind because a lot of people just don't realise how easy this stuff is in the kitchen because they haven't done it before. Once yeah. you do it, it's easy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, to me, when, you, you know, when you're talking about that side of things, I think, you know, if some of these athletes, if they saw that, yes, you can make breakfast in less than three minutes, you can make chicken cacciatore or whatever else you like to have in nine minutes, this sort of stuff, if the structures are there and you've got the basic skills. Yeah. That's where it needs to start from. Who influences that? It comes down to the family. Yeah, I guess the parents, yeah. 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 And, then, and then, see, remember, Rob, because we're getting old now. Yeah. We've, we've come from a generation that, that our parents probably cooked, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of adults now that came from, yeah, there's parents no cooking. Didn't cook. Yeah. You know, and even now the generations now, parents don't cook 
And so the kids are going to grow up thinking, well, you know, menu log and everything else like that's a way of life now. Yeah, that's right. You know, and as soon as we, here's the other thing, Rob, and I suppose you can tell I'm getting a bit passionate about this now because it's, it's something that's a bit of a claw in my, my side. As soon as we start to, to hand over our health to the food manufacturing business. Oh, yeah, we're screwed. You know, yeah, and, we, and people don't realise, and this is whole a big smoke screen, that people don't realise that food manufacturing has nothing to do with our health. It has mm. all to do with profit and a bottom line dollar. Yeah. And so as soon as people start to buy into, you know, things like menu log and home delivery, they're all a part of life now. Yeah. That's where a lot of our health problems come from. Yeah. And that's where a lot of our performance problems come from. I saw so, something. Yeah, sorry for getting off my. I'm getting no, off. no, no, I love it. I mean, we could talk all day for on this stuff. <laughs> um, I saw something interesting uh, a little while ago, uh, which showed that, which was news to me. Um, there's something like I might. Have, it's either five or six, but there's. I'll say five. There's five companies that make the world's food. Wow. And when you look at, like, uh, let's say Nestle, I don't know if that's their proper name, but like Nestle, for instance, you think, oh, well, if I say Nestle to you, like when I was a kid, Nestle, I used to think chocolate. Yeah. But of course, uh, well, it's basically a confectionery company, that, but uh, they now make all kinds of different things. Yeah. And they, it's yeah. just, if you're like hidden under another brand name and you think, oh, well, it's something else. But um, yeah. all of this is coming from the same board, the same directors, the same direction, just different management and business units and stuff. But the ethos isn't, okay, let's maximise people's nutrition. It's like, here's another opportunity that we can use to maximise profit. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so. and that, well, that's right. They're in a business, I suppose, and that's how they got to look. But, yeah, when it's sort of cloaked in that whole thing of it becomes a way of life now, and that's something, as you know, with our courses, we always look at, okay, you know, having these things as bonus foods is, you know, that's okay. You know, no one's saying you've got to be, you know, a yeah. Spartan monk. 100% anal. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, you know, if you want to have a burger every now and then, that's great. Take the kids out for a pizza or whatever. And you can't do that now, but, you know, maybe order in on a Friday night. That's okay. But, you know, that a lot of the research, Rob, and this was something that really opened my eyes, was we have a, our brains are very, we like to, the way we're programmed in our brains, for example, there's been a lot of studies where, for example, they would, follow, monitor and look at families and do questionnaires with families. Say, okay, how, how many takeaways do you have a week? You know, that sort yeah. of thing. They'd say, oh, twice a week. It's only twice a week, once a week. And then actually follow them through the months, whatever it is. And then they realize it's five, six yeah. times a week. And I said, what do you think? I said, well, you just don't realize. You just yeah. don't realize. And, and this is a lot of psychology. Our brains are very good at blocking out mistakes. Yeah. Our brains are very good at distorting um, like people think, and again, this is another whole conversation. I know we're going off. People like to think their their memories are, you know, snapshots and clear and everything. Yeah. You know, when you get to the research on 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 thought processes and brains, is we're just a mishmash of, of of visions and thoughts in our brains, and we can easily put things together the way we want to see them. That's right. You know, and, we'll find and a way to justify it to ourselves. Exactly right, and and we not that we're lying a lot of the times, but a lot of times that's what we genuinely think what happened. You know, this was the size of the food I ate, or this is how often I ate something. Yeah. When you really record it, it's not the case. Yeah, that's right. So that's um that's another whole di dilemma I think that our society is fighting with all the time now is because we think we might be doing the certain things that are right when in fact unless you unless you're tracking and monitoring, then it is actually quite different to tell otherwise. So if you think about. As, so we've got, it's around 67%, and so I think it's 70% in the, the US, uh, overweight and obesity issues. Mm. Do you think that the main issue with that is food and people's lack of education around it, eating too much of the wrong stuff, too much processed, not enough plant-based food, getting the timing wrong? It, you know what, Rob, and probably, you know, the, one of the catch cries or always taught in my courses is that nutrition is never about food. Mm. It's about everything else surrounding the food. It's about our habits, our beliefs, what we've grown up with, what we think is normal. It's all those associations with the food. It's never about the actual food itself. Mm. Um, and that's where probably a lot of our, our problems as, as families and everything, you know, come from. Like I said, one of the first biggest breakdowns is a lot of families don't cook anymore. Well, yep. they don't cook a lot. Uh, and so therefore, children growing up think this is normal. Um, and then that's where the problems sort of start to go from there. Mm. So there's, there's all those sort of little one percenters in that side of things. And the other thing is, Rob, as you know, you know, I've got a PhD in 
nutritional biochemistry. I could write you out the greatest meal plan in the on the planet. You know, get all the carbs and the fats completely spot on. Hand it to you on an Excel spreadsheet on a platter. You know, how long would the average person follow it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, a day, if that, not even, because mm. there's all those other barriers around that that are in, impeding people. Generally, you stop everyone in the street. And you ask them what they know they should be eating more of, and yeah. then ask them what they know they should be eating less of, and they'll get they it right. the answer. Yeah. yeah, it's whether they do it or not. That's the good. problem, and that's where the, that's the multi-million dollar question about actually looking at the whole environmental aspect of why people make the decisions they make when it comes to food, um, lifestyle, living the way they do. Yeah, I, I think. Um... You know, people know that, okay, if I did these things for 90 days, then I'd be in a completely different outcome and I'd really love the outcome of that. Uh, but they don't do it. And like, uh, like I, that's why I love so much working with nutrition now and mindset because uh, like it's easy to go and, you know, look up a workout and go do a workout and that kind of stuff. Not that people get that necessarily right either, but I find that the, like the mindset is just so powerful in driving Mm. Uh, you know why you're going to behave a certain a certain way like mm. like you and I talked about when you started working with me um, what do you want and tell me why you want it so badly because if that's weak if the why is weak then it's not going to happen mm. um, yeah and that's 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 a big thing isn't it a lot of a lot of people that and I always sort of relate to this it's um <laughs> I, I never forget I was on, uh, we, we used to do internships and I was in an exercise phys lab for my first or second year. And we, we used to get, we used to test people, you know, stress test people on the, on the treadmill, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And we had this fellow come in and he wasn't that old, probably late thirties, very overweight. He walked in, he got a brand new pair of running shoes and he had them in the box. So he ripped them open and he put them on or whatever and got on the treadmill. And I think he was on the treadmill and they put it up like a, a 1% incline and his heart rate just shot up. And yeah. my supervisor that was there at the time, because I was just an intern watching, you know, I was a kid. He just slammed the button to stop the treadmill. And the guy looked over and said, what did you do that for? He said, I did that because if I didn't, you were going to die. <laughs> and he, you know what? He looked at him and he said, bloody good decision. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, that's what it means. It, it comes down to unless you have that huge warning bell, unless you sit across that from the table from that physician or that doctor and that doctor says, listen, unless you do something, you are going to, you're going to die, you know, or you're going to, you're going to be in a very bad place. People don't have that why they should be doing something. Yeah. You know, and that's unfortunate in our society that it gets to that, you know, it gets to that where you sit across from that health professional, unless you do this, you are going to die. Yeah. You know, unless you stop doing this, you're going to have a massive heart attack or stroke or whatever it is. We have to try and work out a way to get people to, to that point before the big catastrophe is going to happen. Yeah. And that's not easy. No, it's not. It's the, the biggest conundrum and some, but why some people are successful and others just aren't, they just don't have a, they have a pretty weak why in, in many cases, the, the longer that I work with people, um, yeah, I can pretty much ask them five questions, spend like 10, 15 minutes with them and know whether they're going to be really committed to the program or not and whether they're going to get the results or not. Um, so, Paul, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, there's just a couple of more questions. I wanted to ask you about coaching. Because obviously, we're, we're both coaches. You coach me. Um, what, uh, I'm just wondering on what impact coaching has had for, for your life, coaches that you've had and, and so forth. Look, I, I suppose my coaches, I've, I haven't really had a lot of health coaches from that point of view. I probably had some influencing people. The irony is if all through my football years, I ended up being the conditioner of nearly every single football team that I trained. Um, right. And that was even up to the pretty high levels. I was end up, I was conditioning and playing in the team at the same time. Cause I, you know, I wanted to control what we were doing from a, from a conditioning point of view, but probably more about life balance and, and great business people that I'll probably work with. And again, like my, my, my boss at, at AST sports science, he sort of taught me a lot about life management and, and, and how he approached things. And then the guys, the bodybuilders I worked with, they taught me a lot as well. You know, they, the way that they just organized their lives for success because they wanted to succeed at something. And you sort of look at that and go, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. And even, I, I suppose I learned a lot from my wife as well. When I first met Shah, you know, my wife's won two world titles in figure shaping 20 years ago. And I remember her telling me the things that she used to do every day just to be able to, you know, get up to win that, 
yeah. title and you, you sort of look at that from, from that point of view and, yeah, that's good if you're driven. Um, but then you've got to try and look at, okay, how do you apply some of that skill for your own life and, and, and what you're doing? And, and I think a lot of that comes down to actually wanting to be happier with yourself. And they, yeah. a lot of people talk about that whole moving away from pain and all that sort of stuff. But I think happiness is a big thing in the human brain. Like we always, we're intrinsically, we want to be happy and we crave happiness. Yeah. And we just need a pathway to try and get that sometimes. And, and sometimes that happiness, Rob, comes from the smallest things like, having a partner that, that, that really loves us or, or is really attracted yeah. to us, that sort of thing. And yeah, being able well, to do that every day and surf. Yeah, well, that's another thing as well too, you know, especially it's, it's good for your head that way. I want to go out later and surf. <laughs> You'll have to come up. Mate. Look having, the waves are pretty good at the background there. And you're, yeah, uh, just having you're somebody good. wax up the board right now. <laughs> Don't uh, use wax anymore, mate. We've got deck pads now. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> um, so tell me, I'm sure people are curious as to know what would a typical day of like food and exercise look like for you? Look again, that's probably the thing. And you know, you're in our group, our coaching group there. And I posted the other day, one of the guys asked, "What do I eat?" He said, "Okay, well, I'll write it down for you and, and mm. show you." Uh, you know, a lot of people think because when when we go to parties and that sort of thing, Rob, like I never talk about what I do ever. Yeah, yeah because people ever ask me. Out. I always steer it away from it. You know, sometimes I even lie, you know, sometimes I'll say I'm an accountant or something like that just to you yeah. know, try and shut them up. Because as soon as you do, you just get on that sort of path where you're talking about stuff that just people don't really want to know about. Yeah, that's how they cringe. Yeah. So, so the, the, the whole thing with, with that is what I just tend to do is I'm never a fanatic yeah. because that's, they're the boring people. They don't get invited to parties or anything like that. The, right. the, when you, <laughs> when you, when you just live with a, you know, with a balance of things, then you can never go too wrong, you know. And like I said, I think you've, you've heard me say this with Sharon and I, there's always chocolate in our house. Mm. You know, there's always a, a bottle of champagne in our fridge, you know, that sort of thing. But it doesn't mean we have it every day and it doesn't mean we drink it every day. Yeah. You know, and that's probably the thing that a lot of people, when it comes back to trying to find that why, it's, there's a lot of people who will say, oh, yeah, but if there's chocolate in the, in the fridge, I'll eat all of it. I've got to eat all of it. Yeah. So, well, why what's what's going on there you know oh, if there's a bottle if i open a bottle i've got to drink the whole bottle so well, why what's the what's the underlining thing there there's something obviously driving you to want to drink all that you know there's got to be something there and yeah. that's what you've got to really try and get to with people is find out okay if, you know the, the the extremes that people want to go to and the other irony is rob is this massive upsurge of the way people eat now like as you know and i'm not dissing how people want to eat because I think it's fascinating, but the upsurgence in vegan eating in the last yeah. three to five years, that sort yeah. of thing. And I remember back when I was a biomed student, I was studying these sort of things and vegan eating was, is the most stringent, difficult form of vegetarian eating by far. And it's just like, yeah. it's most difficult. You have to be so organized. You have to be so yeah. you know regimented with what you're doing. And it really comes things like intermittent fasting and everything else. It's like, yeah, well, they're all good, but, Really what it's telling us, when, when you see these hundreds of thousands of people going after these sort of eating plans like keto and cutting out carbs and all this sort of stuff, they're, they're doing it because they're trying to find an answer. They're yeah. trying to find a simple answer to something. Yeah. You know, and probably the irony was, and I, I think uh, I had this conversation about the intermittent fasting with, with, with a few people, is that a lot of people follow this because they just, if they think they don't have to eat, then it's one less thing to worry yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, and some people will, you know, some people think it's going to work and that's, that's fine. And it might improve what they're doing by making them more aware. But I think that's all a lot of eating programs do is as soon as an eating program makes you more aware of what you're eating, that's probably the, the hardest battle with people is to make them more aware of what they're doing day to day. Yes. Because most people live on habits, you know, 70% yeah. of what we do every day is a habit. We don't think. Yeah. So, you know, knocking over that bowl of chips, that packet of chips, those six beers at night, you know, it's yeah. a habit every night. Yeah. You don't even think about it. It doesn't register. Yeah. So anytime we, we look at a plan that starts to make us, oh, okay, if I don't eat at this time, then what do I eat after that? You know, if I, if I, what do I eat after a workout? People start to be aware of what they, what they think they should be eating and that's always a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So I've got a big question for you now. So when I, uh, I've got two more questions for you. Uh, so uh, this year I decided that I wanted to get into the, the shape of my life. I wanted to get that, you know, really defined six pack and everything. And like I said at the start, I wanted to go with somebody that I trusted and knew that wouldn't be saying, well, hang on. No, you, you're eating the wrong foods, the wrong timing, all that kind of stuff. I need you to do this. 
And so, because I've been living this way for so long, I just wanted, I knew that if I just made some tweaks, then I could get the outcome. But of course, I've never done what I'm trying to do for my body, um, as we've talked about before. So we don't know exactly how it's going to respond. Um, so I wanted to ask you, so you can tell the whole world, how am I going? Do you think we're about... <laughs> Um, I think I'm up to about, oh gee, it's about 25 weeks or something now. I've got 15 weeks to go until my final, my final deadline. How am I traveling? Uh, mate, let me tell you, you're one of the best students I've worked with. I'll oh. tell you that now, flat out. So we're not even, even being on camera, um, that's an honest truth. And one of the things was two, two reasons simply, Rob, is, is one, you're coach, coachable. Um, mm. And two, you had a very clear goal with what you wanted to do. And that's, that's probably the two essences of, of what you need to have with, with people that want to change. They want, you need someone that wants to listen and learn and apply. And obviously they've got to have that really strong driving carrot yeah. uh, at, at, at the end there. And, and you've been absolutely fantastic and you're doing it through probably the hardest time in human history. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> that's the, that's the... So many challenges. Yeah. So that's uh, mate, it is a credit to you because I know that there's a lot of people that have probably fallen by the wayside, but the fact that you're still running a business now, you know, and you're still trying to hold your business together and you've got a family to look after as well and, and give yeah. them attention as well. And you're still hung on to this goal. And, and that's probably been the thing. And I think you've probably learned a lot about yourself on this process as well. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I think I've always been like very strong and determined, but um, like I've been trained, this is my 32nd year of training and I've never achieved the look that, like sitting here right now, I'm in the best shape that I've ever been in in my life. That's very cool. Um, and I think, well, why haven't I done that before? And like you find ways to justify, like we were talking about before, you find ways to justify why I'm not there. But I, this year I said, you know what? 2020 is my year. I'm, this is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm going to do it. And to be honest, I apologise if you can hear. Can you hear the cat meowing in the background? No, no, I can't. I can't. No, you're right. He wants to go out. <laughs> um, and it actually hasn't been that difficult. And, and you're right. I have never created a big enough reason as to why I wanted to do it. And I'll, ta I'll tell you this. where um, So one of the most painful exercises that I do now, which I've never done before, is the single leg press. <laughs> now, where my leg press machine is, I'm very grateful that I've got my own studio, but on my wall above it, um, I say dreams come true here. And when I get to that point, you know, the lactic acid is really building up and you, you really could easily stop. You could say, do you know what, if you did a poll of 10 people and we said, look, should I stop now? They'd say, yeah, no, nah, look, you've done a lot. You know, you're up early, you know, just stop. I look at that and I think dreams come true here. And in those, you know, those moments where you think, okay, you've got to have a big vision. And then when you need it, it's like, you know, it rolls through really fast, like you see on the movie sometimes, like on a comic strip, for instance. Yeah. And I see myself standing on stage. I see myself tanned up, waxed up or whatever it is, cool. to the head, cool. yep. holding the check above my head. The music, the Thunderstruck, ACDC, Thunderstruck is booming out. 5,000 <laughs> people are, uh, you know, screaming, clapping, and those streamers are coming out. That's it. And, and I see that when I'm in the pain. Cool. Because in order to, well, you, you know, in order to achieve what I want to achieve, I have to hurt myself a lot multiple times a week. And it's counterintuitive to having a healthy life or enjoying it. But you've got to love the training. And um, I, one of the things that I picked up from Rochelle Hawks, do you remember Rochelle Hawks? Hockey player, Australian hockey player, gold medalist. Okay, yep. Um, she was talking last night and um, one of the things that she said that she attributes her success to, and then Ken Wallace, the, the rower, he agreed with it. He mm -hmm. says, always train harder than you play. Oh, there you go. And it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because then when you yeah. get on the field, it's like, well, that's just what we're doing. And I see this as the same thing. You know, all of those things bring me to this. So to, to, to be honest with you, it's really about fine tuning the knowledge and, you know, the timing and like you giving that extra information about the, you know, how much protein to be taking in here, uh, which is tweaking my knowledge. Some, some things before, like um, this isn't going to mean a lot to people talking, but their metabolic window of eating around our workouts and the four meals in the three hours. And I always used to think that I had to have an hour's rest after my workout, post-workout before I ate again. You said, no, no, no you need to be eating you know, as soon as possible, getting more red meat in, yeah. all those sorts of things. And 
you know, it's just demystified everything. You know, like my muscles are harder than ever before. I'm leaner than ever before. I'm I'm more tanned. Than I've, ever been I've got less. Hair. I've got less hair on me than I've ever had before. The kids having fun tanning me up and saying, oh, good. "Dark enough." Um, so it's a it's a really really cool experience. That's a COVID activity, isn't it? It's tanning dad. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but one more question before my closing comments. So this has been awesome, Paul. Um, what would your tip be for people right now that I think people are going to come out of COVID, you know, you see it, they're going to be fatter, not fitter. But what would your one tip for people going through COVID right now, obviously in Victoria, we're doing a lot harder than anywhere else, that you would say to people around the world to say, do you know what? This is what you need to be thinking, saying to yourself, whatever, to help, you know, keeping an eye, improving your health and fitness. You know what, to be honest, um, I think with so much pressure and so much stress that people are under, I think the last thing that obviously a lot of people think about is working out because I think a lot of people do think of working out as being an arduous pain and it's painful and it hurts. Maybe we need to rebrand it, Habes. It's work out. Maybe, maybe. And that's, you you know what, that's that's pretty close to the bone because one of the things I know that Shara and I found, I, I personally, I've struggled working out at home. It's something that I, I've always gone to a gym because I physically have to remove myself because I work from home and, and yep. you know, it's, it's hard that way. And so I've struggled and I know that Shah struggled a little bit as well with the not being able to, she's a very social butterfly as you can imagine. So what I virtually did was just take the pressure off and just, just go and do something and just, just start moving. And yep. it doesn't matter if it's particularly easy and just make sure that you do it each day and you build in and you just start enjoying what you're doing. So for instance, yep. I remember when we had the, we ordered one of the laughs I put on Facebook the other day was um, our gym gear finally arrived in the first week of March. Good in March, yeah. Yeah, and the the delivery driver gave me a gobful. He said, like, the gyms are open now, don't you know? And I didn't have that to tell him I ordered this four months ago. I've been standing here for three months. Thanks for having us. And and all we had for for months was just like a TRX band and a couple of rubber bands. And I'm like a gym guy. I'm thinking, how do I do this? Yeah, and they wait. It just made us realise that, you just got to go back and just start moving, start stretching, just start doing all the basic little things yeah. and just start enjoying the feeling of moving. Yeah. And that's probably the biggest thing. And I think a lot of people that are either new to exercise or everyone's exercised in the past and they've, they've fallen off the wagon and want to get back into it. And they've always got that in the back of their mind. Oh, this is going to hurt. I'm going to be sore tomorrow. I'll put it off. I'll put it off. And it's just yeah. like, no, just take the pressure off. Yeah. Just, yeah. just, just start move. moving. Yeah, just get that band and just start doing something with it. You know, just start moving it, start stretching it, you know, just start, get a couple of exercises off YouTube for God's sake and just start and just enjoy it. Don't try and make it too regimented. Don't try and make it too hard. Don't try and make it so that it's going to be a big overwhelming thing because a lot of people that get OCD with this sort of stuff do that. They get distressed because they think they can't make these great workouts. It's just like you've got to just start moving first and getting functional first. Yeah. And then just let it take its course. Every yeah. day, every week, you'll just get a little bit better. And then all of a sudden, you'll start to do those full-blown workouts that you probably never thought you would do. It's the people that try and jump into those full-blown workouts right from, you know, doing nothing. Yes. That's the hardest part and that's the dread that people have. People have to fall in love with movement and exercise again and make, yeah. it, make it an enjoyment. That's probably the biggest tip I can give you. Yeah, that's that's great advice, Paul. Fantastic. Hey, listen, uh, I appreciate your time so much today. Um, Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you as a coach. Like I say, one of the, I don't know. I think you can you can put down those significant people in your life that have really had an impact on on your life, and you're certainly one of those for me. I mean, eight years ago, right. my life completely changed for uh, for the better, and certainly what you're helping me with right now is helping me achieve, you know, the body and health uh, to go with that, not just to look good, but to feel good and be energised and just feel amazing. Um, and, you know, you've, you've, you've done that for me. So, so grateful for having you in my life, having you as my coach. And thanks so much for sharing your insight today. We could talk for weeks on this. I love the science and everything that you do. So thanks so much, Paul. Mate, thank you. What a compliment. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm humbled. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you for having me. And, uh, and let's make sure we nail this in, uh, in November. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Pleasure.